great. Hi, everybody. I'm really happy to be back today, um, but really happy that we have Elaine Gabovich as our guest today. And um, FYI, I've known uh, Elaine for, it's been 12 years, I think, Elaine. Um, wow. As, I know, as a friend and a mentor. And um, yesterday I was on the Elizabeth Warren uh, phone call around focused on the disability community and a little thought in the back of my head said oh you know my dream ticket is Warren Gabovich <laughs> because seriously Elaine you just oh, know how to get things done <laughs> you do it in such a incredibly meticulous way so we're really really lucky to have you at DPH and in your especially important role there um, so I'm gonna just do a couple of slides to to um, let people know what's going on today and um, and then and then we'll hand it over to you okay so um, I just wanted to quickly do a shout out because Sounds this good. weekend Thank is you. Mother's Day weekend and um, very special mom up there, Kathleen Amaralt, who is uh, one of our, the ARC team members. And I'm really grateful for her. And I just wanted to say that I know all of the moms right now are um, just really showing incredible fortitude for their families and for their community. And I think, you know, we can sort of see the light at the end of the tunnel right now and we just stay um, stay on course and keep this incredible solidarity of our community. Um, and maybe we got to dig in a little bit longer and a little bit harder, but we're going to get through. So happy Mother's Day to everybody out there. And not that the dads aren't doing a great job too, but it's Mother's Day. So, <laughs> um, okay. So I just wanted to tell you our goals for today <laughs> to get the info and the update from Elaine which will be great. And then I'm gonna just talk a little bit about our focus groups, which are actually happening today and tomorrow, but it's not too late to get involved in those. Um, and do a quick state update, because a couple, a few uh, good things to talk about. And again, just call your attention to our federal, hugely important federal initiative um, that we're gonna need your help for. So I'm gonna slide out of these slides and open, uh, oops, of course I got a million other ones open and I'm gonna open Elaine's. Give me one second here. So is this sharing for you guys? I may need my helper. Let's see, it looks like it's loading. Sorry guys, it's a slow Google. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I'm just, this is Carrie. So just, this, <clears throat> you, you could maybe stop share and then start share again. Okay. Oh, there we, well, no. Uh, hold on. I want to get it. I don't want to do the Google one because I don't know how, geez, how do you start Google slides? Here we go. I got it. Got it. Woo! Okay. Can you all see that? Can you all see that? Yay. You guys? Yep. There we go. Good. What happened? Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Yes. So take it yes, away, Elaine. Right. Okay. Well, thank you, Maura. Thank you for the invitation, by the way. Um, you know, I am inspired by all of you and all of your advocacy, uh, especially during this really new, normal, weird, challenging time that we are all in, you know, with the COVID virus, I don't think any one of us is, you know, um, knows the answers, you know, we're just trying to write, write the script as we go here. But um, I am really inspired by the stories I've heard about what families are doing right now and what ARC of Massachusetts is doing to lead the way. So I am, um, I'm so happy to be here. Um, so just, um, so I, I'm, I sent to Maura at the very last minute these slides and, you know, they're kind of the, the DPH slide deck, right? But I really wanna speak with you um, just about the work that we do in our division for children and youth with special health needs. And I'm gonna talk about how do, you, how do we describe that and all, but that's under our Title V program. So if you wanna go to the next slide, Maura, I'll share kind of the, um, 
the um, environment in which we work. So we are, so go ahead, you can, great. Okay, thank you. So, oh, um, I did so the divisions, we are one of the uh, divisions within the Bureau of Cam. Yeah, it's there, it's good. Um, so um, we are one of the divisions within the Bureau of Family Health and Nutrition. And so you can see here the other divisions that uh, make up that bureau and we all work side by side with one another and often collaboratively when there's opportunities. But, um, but our division, um, I, I will share with you a little bit more in, in uh, the next few slides about what we do. But if you wanna find out more about the bureau, there's a link right there and the various um, divisions and programs that comprise it. So thank you. We'll go to the next slide. Did it move? Okay, so Title V, you know, what is it? It's what we do within Title V is there, we promote and maintain the health, safety, and well being, as you can see here, of mothers, fathers, infants, and youth, but including, and we really want to call out children and youth with special health care needs and their families. And, you know, we share um, Title V with our um, Division of Pregnancy, Infancy, and Early Childhood, which serves as the maternal and child health part of the equation of Title V. And we take up the children and youth with special health care needs side of that equation. So what are, what are both of, our, of those sides of this Title V work do? We focus on systems. We kind of think at the systems level. And we're often trying to think about, if you've heard the expression before, going upstream. So kind of looking at where are at the systems level, what are solutions that we need that are going to work their way down to individual families and children? So we do a lot of really thinking about um, in the aggregate, what are we hearing from families? What do they need? And how can we influence systems of support? And public health often serves as a convener of other state agencies and other organizations and families and communities to have those discussions. Um, and so part of that is then enhancing the future health and the well-being of society overall. And you hear a lot right now in the COVID environment about all the public health updates and the CDC updates. And it's really in that spirit that you're hearing about those things. We are, for maternal and child health, we are the nation's oldest federal state partnership. And it was enacted, as you see here, in 1935 as part of the Social Security Act. But really it was the need for recognition of the role that mothers at the time and children play in society. And that's gotten more nuanced over the years as we've gotten more sophisticated in this work. So next slide. Got it. Got it. Okay. So the core concepts then, what we want to think about, is we're really about health. And health is more than the absence of disease. It's about um, what we call the social determinants of health, you know, where one lives, what, um, where, what, what access people have to food or to healthcare or to um, housing or all of those things. That all adds up in terms of someone's, a person's health. And so that's the whole socio-ecological framework that we're talking about here. And we incorporate a life course perspective, meaning that what happens before a child is born and the health of that family before a child is born may impact the, their health over their entire life course. And it, so it really matters where you're born. It matters what you have access to or what you don't. It matters in terms of the levels of equity within healthcare. Um, and you've heard often about the term racial equity and it, it, that matters. You know, cultural and linguistic um, access matters. And so we think about all of those things and we do this by looking at data um, looking at policy development that's evidence-based, and then also assuring that services and outcomes are measured. And if uh, we are working on any of those, that we are certainly measuring and tweaking and always trying to work toward improving uh, the work that we do based on evidence and data. So we'll go to the next slide. There you go. So, so the... Um, the definition of um, children and youth with special health care needs is what we call a broad and inclusive def definition. And so it's, um, as you see here, children who have or are at increased risk for chronic physical, developmental, behavioral, or emotional conditions, and who are also require health and related servancy, um, services, excuse me, of a type or amount beyond that required by children generally. And so that's a pretty broad term. 
And, you know, within our division, um, it, well, let me just put some numbers behind this just for a minute. So if you were to think about the state of Massachusetts and who fits into that definition, you're looking at about 20% of the population of children, let's say from birth to age 19, according to a survey that we use for some of that data. And it is, um, and so we're looking at about 280,000 kids. That's huge. And so that's the tip of the iceberg. So you can see if you're looking at a very, very broad description, um, then it's very hard to work individually with one-to-one um, -one with families. And so that's where the systems level and the population level thinking comes up in public health in terms of um, what we learn from individuals and families and the trends help the greater good. So we'll go to the next slide. There you go. So the next slide then talks about um, children with medical complexity. And that is a group that we do serve very directly um, as much as we possibly can if families can find us. And sometimes I feel like we're the best kept secret. But for children with medical complexity, they're defined as you see here, chronically complex, um, medically complex, multiple significant chronic health problems that affect multiple organ, organ systems and result in functional limitations, big categories, um, big something to note here, high healthcare need or utilization, and often the need or use for medical technology. And so those children you'll hear about in some of the programs I'll share with you, but they're not the only ones that we serve, but I will say that a fair amount of the work we do goes directly to this population. So we'll talk about the next slide in a moment. There you go. I'll just spend a quick minute on this. One of our programs is also our pediatric palliative care program. And just to say that that serves children with life limiting conditions. And um, hopefully you'll get these slides afterwards. I wanted to keep us moving, but just to say that this is how we define life limiting conditions. So oh, our division sorry. is, no, oh, no, it's all good. So, um, <laughs> all right, thanks Laura. So our division is, um, you know, uh, we have um, tried to really, um, this is the house that we um, situate ourselves within. So let's say that our vision is the roof and this is op op optimal health and quality of life for children and youth with special health needs and their families. And our, our mission is really just to, uh, I'll just to boil it down, it has to do with access, access to care, strengthening systems, um, you know, expertise um, in, in, in knowledge and enhancing that at all times, and in get, engaging in continuous quality improvement. We look at the six core outcomes that are part of Healthy People 2020. They haven't really been updated to 2030 yet, but those are things that might be familiar to you. Things like early identification of, of uh, disabilities or special health care needs. Things like, um, so through screening or partnering with families and fully engaging families in a decision-making process. And how does that work at the systems level? How do we work with the medical world as an example in trying to promote that? Which also includes having a medical home and having a dedicated physician and teams that work with your child. How do we set up a quality medical home and how do we help families know what that is? We also have um, community-based systems of care that are organized in ways that families can get to them easily. We're constantly striving for this. This is where access comes in. And transition to adult health care is another big piece for us. We do work with our colleagues in education in other areas because you have to think about health through the whole child. But the piece that we are looking at has to do with moving from pediatric to adult health care. And and to the degree that a, a child can to manage their own self-care and their own outcomes. And then, of course, we're always looking at equitable um, payment systems and working with um, Medicare and uh, so that would be or Medicaid, MassHealth and others on how do we how do we inform them of what families need from our having our ear to the ground. We have a number of values that we also pull upon, but I will I will leave those for now and we'll continue about what our programs do. So one of the things that we do in terms of, thank you. So we use the National Survey of Children's Health and that's online. If you're ever curious, you could look it up and just poke around and look at some of the data yourself. But this for us is, um, it's a, a tool that we have used for many years to help us monitor how families that are interviewed through this survey really rate um, the, their needs, how the system is working for them. And they look at a whole variety of different things. And that's for all children and youth up to the age of 19, this survey 
um, surveys through. We'd love it if they went to 22, but they don't right now, although we're advocating for that. But, um, but what they, they provide us with are data that we can use to monitor and then to really dig in and, and use to those as some clues that we can then tap into as we're talking with families about their needs and their health um, care and, uh, and outcomes that they have. So we'll go to the next slide and I'll show you a couple of highlights in that data. So you can see here, it's, um, every year is, uh, it's rolled out nationally, then every two years the states get their data. And so you can see here how Massachusetts stacks up to um, the U.S. in um, terms of, um, you know, the, the percentage of children who have special health care needs in the U.S. and in, the, in Massachusetts, the percentage of families that report their child has a medical home in Massachusetts and in the country, and of course those that report transitioning um, fully to adult health care. And so you can see there that all of these, uh, well, the, the number of children is what it is, but then when you're looking at how people describe a medical home, or how people describe, um, you know, moving um, the, their transition to adult health care. Um, there's a lot that we need to be working on, and this is where Title V and our role can really help move those numbers, as they say, move the needle. So the next slide um, just gives an example of. So I mentioned before about population health, and that's that larger number of 280,000 that I was talking with you about. And then we also have enabling services that really serve those children with medical complexity and others that, that take advantage of our services that I'll describe in a moment. We have a few things that are direct one-to-one -one services, but mostly when you're talking about enabling services, that's things like information and referrals. So we have a community support line as an example that people can call and we can help you navigate the system of care by working with you in an enabling way to provide more information. And we also have care coordinators that work more closely with families who are eligible because of their level of need. And those care coordinators stay in a direct relationship with the family all the way until the, the child or youth's 22nd birthday. So anyhow, that gives you kind of a general sense of how we break things down. So now our next slide, and I'm keeping my eye on the time. Tell me what, how much um, time more I have. You got a few minutes. A few, a few more minutes, minutes, okay. All right. So, um, so then, this is these are the programs that fall under our division. And so, as I mentioned before, we have a one eight hundred community support line. I would highly encourage any families that are looking for assistance um, to give us a call. And the number um, I'm going to share with you right now, and I think it's on probably one of my last slides, but just in case, if you have a pen, the number is one eight hundred eight eight two. One four three five, and so give us a call. You know we are hearing we're getting about the same number of calls in this um, current crisis as we typically get throughout the year. But I will tell you that the nature of the calls and the complexity of the calls is much more involved. And so we are doing our very best then to help families by researching what a need is that they present. We also we do an intake, but we also in addition to that. We'll ask families a few more wraparound questions so that we get a better sense of what they need. And we may present other options than just simply what they presented to us. They'll come out of a phone call with one of our specialists who are social workers or parents or one's an attorney with much more um, information than what they started with. Um, and a lot of our folks are also parents as well. So at the care coordination program then, we have 11 care coordinators that are across the state. And they, as I said before, identify resources and referrals for families. They're very strong advocates. And most of them speak Spanish and English, at least. Um, some speak uh, Brazilian Portuguese, and they're from both cultures. So they really identify with a lot of the families that they're serving. Um, and the, the eligibility for that is really from ages three all the way up to 22. They have a dedicated care coordinator. Um, Another program that we have here is our Catastrophic Illness and Children's Relief Fund, which is what I would call the pair of last resort. So if MassHealth does not cover something like durable medical equipment or other things, a family could apply to the Catastrophic Fund and it would go through a review. 
Um, and if it um, comes out to be about more than 10% of a family's income, there's a very good likelihood, depending on what it is, that the parent would be or the family would be reimbursed for what they've already spent. So it's a really good thing to know about. There's a commission around it that meets monthly. I would encourage people to check that out. Um, we also have family initiatives, and one of those is family ties. And I'm, I'll bet you've all, or many of you have heard about the family ties program that is under the Federation, funded by the Department of Public Health. And they are the central directory for getting into early intervention. So that's where families should go to find out where their local EI is and to make a connection. But in addition, um, for our division, what they do is they provide family to family supports. And they also have, their, there are I think six um, family members that are information and referral specialists and they help families navigate the systems of care and they have lived experience. So they know what it's like to walk in your shoes and get you where you need to be. And they're doing things right now in this crisis, like running food to families and other things they would not normally do. Normally what they do is just over the phone helping families, but they're so committed that they have really gone over and above the call of duty in this crisis. Um, we have a hearing aid fund that provides um, uh, help uh, with uh, hearing aids and funding for that. I mentioned our pediatric palliative care program earlier. Those are eight provider organizations across the state of Massachusetts, and they help with unmet physical, emotional, spiritual supports for families of children with life-limiting conditions. They offer SIB support. They serve to up to the age of 19, and they're the only program we have that just goes to 19. Everything else is 22. Um, and, you know, again, they are just a godsend for families um, and a really, I'm always amazed at the work that they do. Our mass care program is our um, Ryan White HIV AIDS program for um, older youth who may have HIV. We have um, uh, three community health centers in Massachusetts that participate in the mass care program. Mass Start are nurses at Boston Children's Hospital and UMass Medical School that go into schools and train school nurses on how to include kids with medical necessities such as durable medical equipment or other things, uh, assistive technology in the classroom. The medical review team is um, for those uh, families who are in need of respite and they have a child in short-term respite and they have a child with a developmental age of 24 months or less with two skilled nursing needs. The review team takes a look and determines if they are approved to go into one of two pediatric skilled nursing facilities in Massachusetts where MassHealth would cover for that. And if the facilities have beds and they accept the child in, they're, they're in. But the medical review team will first approve this. The reasoning behind this is to prevent um, unnecessary institutionalization of children for longer than a 90 day period at the same time as giving parents a short break, which is so important to families. Um, we have a public benefits specialist that can help um, navigate mass health and SSI. We have a universal newborn hearing screening program that looks at all the outcomes of birth certificates in the state for hearing screening at birth. And they do follow-ups of 95% of the families whose children are flagged um, to follow up and encourage the family to go for a full um, workup with their doctors. And so we lose very few families to follow up for that based on those birth records. And we're also working uh, much more actively as we go into the future on youth transition initiatives. We put in a grant every five years for the work that we're going to do. And in this version of our next grant that will be from 2020 to 2025, I believe, will be uh, transition will be a strong focus there. We'll go to the next slide. So um, this is how, you know, to check us out, um, you get in touch with us. Um, I would encourage you to do so. And, um, you know, we would love to hear from you um, and help you in any way that we can. And um, the last slide gives my contact information. So my email address is right there. Feel free to reach out. And if you have any questions that I don't either have time for or we couldn't get to today, um, you, know, you know where to find me and I'm happy to get back to you. Thank you, Elaine. That is so much information that people just don't know how much DPH is doing, um, you know, for children with special health care needs. So really appreciate that. Do we want to take a couple questions? I can't see the chat at the moment. Carrie, do we have any yeah. chat? In? Um, we, we do have, uh, this is Carrie. We do have two questions. Um, Jazzy was wondering, uh, any data on the effect of block grants on title 
programs, Title V programs. Any data of the effect of the block grant on Title V programs? I, I, I'm trying to think about um, that question. Yes. So, um, so that we, we, yes, okay. So, um, so the Title V programs, um, the block grant does come from Title V. And so that block grant um, is used toward uh, many of the services that I just shared with you, it pays for a lot of those things. In addition to the maternal and child health programs um, such as home visiting and early childhood services and welcome baby and others. And so all of those programs, all, all of our programs do collect data on the number of families that we serve or the you know, um, demographics of those families and uh, or some of the outcomes. We do everything with a um, continuous quality improvement lens on it. In addition um, to that, I think that using the national survey data is helpful and we're always reaching out to the community as an, as an, um, uh, an example of that. Just the other day, I asked Maura if I could, you know, if um, it, at some point in time, if she'd be willing to share some of the data from your survey so that we know what people are, are here or what they need. We go out and we do a lot of focus groups as well um, and uh, key informant interviews. And we're getting ready actually to launch a survey at some point as well for our block grant. So those are some examples of some data. I hope that gets at your question. I guess what I'm really, this is Josh. Okay, and then I guess Herb was wondering. <clears throat> oh, go ahead, Josh. Um, I, I guess what I was really trying to get to was, was is there any sense, for instance, the block grant, let's say, the programs before block grants were instituted versus after, because I'm very interested in that because of the discussion around having other programs go to block grants. And I was wondering if there's any way of seeing what are the effects of doing that on the quality of the programs? And is there any historical data on that that we can fall back on or use as a... Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, the, the block grant, sure, sure. The block grant here in Massachusetts is pretty long standing. Trying to remember when it was first um, put into place, and I think it was in the 80s. But I'd be happy to follow up with you on that. Um, you know, if you want, please reach out to me and I can see, talk to some of my colleagues and, uh, you know, give you some data or some, you know, information that might help you. Okay, thanks. Great. Thanks, Elaine. Thank you. And um, yes. Herb was just another quick question. Herb was wondering, can you give us an example on how data is fostering continuous improvement? Yes, absolutely. Um, so, you know, one of the things that um, data, so think about data in this respect, qualitative and quantitative data, right? And so one thing um, in terms of quality, let's start with qualitative data just for a minute. So in terms of we have an advisory um, group, we have focus groups that we reach out to. Um, we uh, are working to set up new advisories on different topics and things. But often um, that data that we collect, as an example, we met with our advisory group the other day on the effects of COVID and what that might mean in the future to, um, to programs um, that we may offer. Some of the things that we also look at are data around things like racial equity in healthcare or the social determinants of health or trying to understand and move up um, the mental health care needs of families by working um, as part of healthcare and thinking about mental health. So we're, we're, look, we're always tapping into some of these larger questions. Now in terms of quantitative data um, and in terms of continuous improvement, whenever we're taking on a project for, as an example, we might set a name statement for ourselves and we might uh, create goals and objectives and all of those things should be measurable so that by the time that a project is done and, and also as a way to to guide us through the project, to tweak it in a kind of a, what we call plan, do, study, act type, type of a capacity. We'll look to see, did what we plan, is it working? And if it didn't, should we tweak it? And that's based on data and information. And then when we um, adjust it, then we, um, and then we do it again, we then continue with this, this type of quality improvement type of a, a method to make sure that we're learning as we go. Um, but when we're done with our projects, we will also report on that to our funders and others, um, which leads me to also encourage you to go online and you can look up um, Title V and you can look up what every state is reporting on annually um, in their block grant reviews and there's tons of data in there. So that's another place that I would encourage you to take a look and see in terms of what does, what did we sign ourselves up for in terms of um, 
goals and objectives? And then what did we report back in on um, that really does speak to quality improvement? Thank you, Elaine. Um, I just wanted to add in, I know you guys have been so busy during the COVID crisis, and we recently heard that early intervention is struggling now and needing some emergency funds. So I know the ARC and I think AFAM as well has signed on to the letter for the governor. Um, is it 50,000 50, kids in early intervention? I, I don't know the exact number, but um, certainly they are suffering right now. Yeah, and an early intervention certainly wants to serve. And so they're asking us to get the word out, you know, um, through our social media channels and others just to let families know that they're, they're up and running, um, you know, and, uh, and to, you know, seek out early intervention if you can. I can't speak in to the numbers more necessarily because my division is separate from EI, so I'm not really monitoring their numbers. But I can certainly um, find out and follow up if, if you'd like on that 50,000 number. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I would just say that, um, you know, early intervention, they've been doing uh, telehealth and all sorts of things to try to do workarounds like everybody's doing right now. Um, one other thing, and there may not be a question for this, but I do want to offer out another thought for people as well. Some of the things that we're thinking about in our division has to do with um, emergency plans of care for families. And we're encouraging, we're getting ready to, we're working with um, Mass Health and the uh, Mass Law Reform Institute to try to create some things that families can use to, um, with either with a provider or someone to help or on their own that can really create that plan um, in the event that someone in the family um, contracts the virus and is hospitalized. We worry about that. And so we feel that every family, we want to encourage families to have that at the ready so that they know what to do in a crisis. Um, and we're getting ready to um, share um, information on that and also um, work with some of the systems uh, to provide uh, places and uh, supports for families. So that's coming. That's huge. Thank you so much. And then hopefully you can convince DDS to do the same. <laughs> we're we're, we're, we're going to reach out to them. Yeah. yeah, good. All right. Great. Thank you so much, Elaine. Um, I know we're a little bit over, but if people want to hang on, we can um, just finish up a few slides. Um, and of course, I can't help but, uh, you know, give you an update on my own kids. And I'll tell you, you know, it's been a roller coaster for my family. Um, but I did just hear, and I think you'll all be kind of hearing, uh, you know, kind of here and there from, from some of our school systems and out of district schools, uh, that plans are, are, are starting to be made. And, um, you know, of course, everything is tentative and probably uh, related to the governor's um, reopening and this advisory committee's reopening, but we are hearing that certain schools are planning for July, and uh, which one of my son's school is, has reached out about that. So um, we're also hearing schools that are planning on continuing uh, the, the virtual learning. So we're waiting for that guidance to come out. And um, I would encourage everyone to continue to use the link uh, that I provided last week, and it's on here today, um, to, to speak directly your comments uh, to the reopening advisory committee. Um, and again, try to, if you're interested, try to uh, register today for either um, the uh, uh, focus group that I'm running that's under 22 um, families who have a child home and is and are experiencing behavioral challenges. And tomorrow, um, Carrie and I will be doing, um, you know, if your son or daughter is in a, a residential home or their home from their day program or home from their residential program, uh, that's that will be a really interesting and important focus group. So, um, and then I just wanted to, you know, do a regular a little update on where we are in terms of the, the surge. And I know if some of you heard the governor yesterday, um, you know, he's still concerned about hospitalization rates and we were seeing a downward trend, but yesterday there was a little bit of a blip with more people hospitalized and more people going into the ICU. Um, so we really wanna see a, a more consistent trending downward <laughs> of all those numbers. Um, but our community may actually be more in the middle of the surge. Um, I know people had asked last week about, or the week before, about numbers of deaths. 
And we had uh, a number, I think it was 34. Um, and a lot of that was coming out of the, um, the Hogan and, and other uh, you know, facilities. Um, this week we had an increase of 16. So, so we are in it. And, um, but one thing to, to remember and note is uh, looking at the numbers, the ages, uh, still looking under 19, the numbers are really small across the state. So um, only 42 uh, people under 19 are hospitalized right now, which is, is good. And I mentioned that because we've been focused kind of on, on children today with, uh, with Elaine and talking about schools potentially reopening in, in the summer. Um, and one more update I wanted to give you is, you know, the, co the coalition that had been working on the crisis standards of care revisions um, had sent our letter uh, off to the secretary about our concerns, even with the revised version. And we did hear back from her, which was great. And she responded to those concerns that we raised and she would like to meet with, with uh, the coalition. Um, she did say, you know, obviously right now, uh, because we do not believe rationing is going to need to happen, that she would like to put this off a little bit while, um, while we, she deals with bigger priorities, but certainly it's on her agenda and I believe we're gonna get in there in June. Um, and some other quick updates, we're still waiting um, for MassHealth to come through on some DAHAB and CBDS payments. Um, we really need to keep our, our day programs whole and um, we may have some sort of action alert coming out on that, so stay tuned. And from the State House, just if you hadn't heard, they had their first virtual formal session on Beacon Hill yesterday. Um, and it was around the short term borrowing bill, which is about $3 billion, um, barring it on the fact that the taxes, the tax revenues will be coming in later this year. So a lot of work still going on. Um, and I wanted to give you these links one more time. The ARC US, and if you have a chance to get onto Ellen Taverna's uh, webinar tomorrow, she's gonna be talking about just this really big push that we need on, on package four for people with disabilities. And again, there's the link for our advisory committee um, of our state to, to submit comments. And I know some of you might've been on the call yesterday with, with Senator Warren's office, but I just thought I'd share from one of my friends who, who grabbed this off the call, her quotes. Um, she's grateful for the fighting spirit that we give and our effectiveness. And, and I couldn't agree more. This is really where, um, where we, we thrive, we know how to fight. And um, also to, to get in this fight now and stay in this fight because it's about resources for the short term, but really we're, we're gonna have some major um, needs long-term, so. I'm happy if everybody can um, continue to uh, join the ARC and really, um, really dig into advocacy because we're going to need it. So thank you, everybody. Any other questions before we um, wrap up? Yep. Uh, let's see. Dennis had a question. Maura, any sense of what the secretary's priorities are in creating a prevention strategy for this, these populations? Hi, Dennis. Um, no, I just, I felt very um, pleased that she was responsive to our letter in terms of wanting to talk. And I do think she's also aware that even though the crisis is not um, leading to rationing at this stage, that, that we could certainly get there again, um, hopefully not. Um, so I think, I think it'll be great to meet with her in June, but I, I really don't know what her prevention strategies would be. I did really feel enthusiastic about Senator Warren's approach too yesterday on the phone. So, um, you know, kind of hitting it from both state and federal would be a good way to go for, for us advocates. Right. Just to fight, this is Dennis. Yeah. Just a, a Dennis, you muted. Can you unmute? Oh, sorry. Yeah, there you go. Start again. I'll go to sleep. Okay. Yeah, sorry, it's, I think it would be helpful to sort of set up a, um, even just a very rough outline of what folks think the, uh, the question should be in terms of ensuring that the secretary is developing an epidemiological approach to high priority populations 
to, to make sure that we're up, working upstream to reduce the chance of folks actually needing to be hospitalized. And that would be testing, tracking, but also providing PPE and, and determining what types of needs families have. And so I, I think that like that's that's a really key element of this that, that, that we need to look at. I, I totally agree, Dennis, and I think we're we're asking for those things a, uh, separately as well. Um, but that opportunity to meet with her around the crisis standards of care is just yeah. another opportunity to push push for that as well. Thanks. Oops, barking the dog there. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Thank you. Oh, thank you. Happy Mother's Day to everybody out there. So I know we kept you a little long, but thank you, everyone. And thanks so much again, Elaine. Oh, thank you for the opportunity. And I've, uh, again, everybody, please take care of yourselves. And um, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak with you today. Really thank appreciate you. it. And thank happy you. Mother's Day. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers on this call. Thank you. Bye, everybody. See you next week, hopefully.